It's always good to hear about youth alive, you know, and um, so great that Mill Park Baptists have got that on, uh, hosting that uh, next week. So look, if uh, it's any young people who haven't been to Youth Alive before, it is a fantastic event. Uh, it's it's going back a few years, but when I was a young adult, I used to be the lead guitarist at those events, which was loads of fun. <laughs> uh, well, today, look, I'm just going to do um, uh, a standalone topic, a one-off topic, which will be the case for kind of this um, term, just going to do a few standalone messages. And today, I'm going to talk about something that's actually, there's there's so much of this in mainstream media, it's just everywhere. But what is the biblical perspective? And so my topic today is this, the bare facts about biblical sex. The bare facts about biblical sex. Very confronting by the sound of that, isn't it? Well, let's start at the very beginning. Let's have a look at the book of Genesis. And so Genesis 2.21, you'll often hear this passage read at weddings. It says, uh, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Then the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot in that passage, actually. Um, now, evangelical Christians believe that God is supernatural. He is all-powerful. And so when you read this, this passage here, although it's a, a powerful analogy in itself, it's also literal. That God, in his creative powers, uh, created a man from nothing, uh, Adam names a whole bunch of amazing animals, but he's not interested in any of them. He's saying, well, God, what about me? You know, where's someone for me? And then God creates a woman taking a rib from Adam to create that woman. So I believe it's literal, but it's also a beautiful analogy. Now, why do I say it's a good analogy? Well, God didn't take something from Adam's head that the woman might rule over the man. He didn't take something from Adam's feet that the man might trample over the woman. Rather, he took something from Adam's side that the two might walk alongside together. And isn't it interesting that the rib is closest to the man's heart? A lot of imagery there, isn't it? Um, there's a phrase in there where it says, um, and uh, the two are united into one. Now, the Apostle Paul, the two shall become one flesh, is the other way it's translated. The Apostle Paul quotes that in the book of Corinthians. And um, he, he says that that is referring to intimacy. That is actually referring to sexual intimacy. Um, you know, it's interesting to me that uh, some, some scholars will say that little phrase there where Adam says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man, is actually a poem or a song. So as soon as he sees her, he's writing poetry. He's singing songs, you know. And, he, and even today, um, like, let's face it, on, you know, you listen to the radio, probably every fourth song is a love song, you know. Um, and uh, a lot of them are written by guys, but, of course, by girls too, you know. Romance makes people want to write poetry and sing, it seems. I'll read that little passage again. Genesis 2.24 to 25, this is the tail end. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is a reminder to us that God, in the design of humans, that he had in mind that he wanted marriage to be a powerful thing, a meaningful thing, and sex was part of his plan as a way of expressing love in marriage. Now, I know some people who may not be that familiar with the Bible might think, well, uh, surely God and the Bible is quite prudish when it comes to sex. Well, no, it's not. You think of one of the books of the Bible, Song of Songs. It's all about intimate love. Let me quote a little bit of it. Song of Songs 7, 5 through 9. This is King Solomon talking about his Shulamite bride. He says to her, Your head crowns you like Mount Carmel. Your hair is like royal tapestry. The king is held captive by its tresses. 
How beautiful you are. How pleasing, my love, with your delight. Your stature is like that of a palm and your breasts like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree. I will take hold of its fruit. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes on the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples and your mouth like the best wine. Clearly, God is not prudish about sexuality. While the Shulamite bride, she responds. She says, may the wine go straight to my beloved. That's referring to Solomon, my beloved, flowing gently over his lips and teeth. I belong to my beloved and his desire is for me. Come, my beloved, let us go to the countryside. Let us spend the night in the villages. Let us go early to the vineyards and see if the vines have budded. If the blossoms have opened and if the pomegranates are in bloom, there I will give you my love. Now, although God is actually very for sexual intimacy, at the same time God has set very clear parameters to where that fits or the boundaries of where he sees that is part of his plan or part of his design. And certainly the scriptures have lots to say about this. I'm going to focus today largely on a passage from Corinthians. Let's have a look at an opening verse here from chapter 6 and verse 13. We'll deal with this whole passage. The Apostle Paul writes this, The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Um, Or the older version puts it this way, The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body quoting from the NIV and the King James there. Now, but what does it mean when you see that phrase, um, immorality or fornication? What is it? Well, if you go back to the original text, let's have a look at this here. The Greek word translated sexual immorality or fornication is the word pornea, pornea. It's used for illicit sexual intercourse or sexual activity. So when you see that that word, sexual immorality or fornication, that's what it's referring to. Um, But there's another word that you've probably thought of as well, the word adultery, not the same thing. Let's have a look at Jesus here talking about this. He identifies both words. 1519, Jesus' words, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. You notice Jesus says sexual immorality, but he also says adultery. Why? Because they're two different things. Um, Let me look at the Greek word that is usually translated adultery. It's the word morphia. Morphia denotes one who has unlawful intercourse with the spouse of another. Now, let's sum it up. Let me explain both to you. So when you see the word adultery in the Bible, it refers to breaking the bonds of marriage with the wife or husband of another person. When you see the word sexual immorality in the Bible, it refers to sexual activity outside of marriage. Okay, got the two? So both, Jesus says, they defile a person. Don't do either. Um, Paul was writing the document to the Corinthians about AD 55. Five years earlier on Paul's second missionary trip, he planted that church. Uh, Now, the city of Corinth is um, a seaport. Let's have a quick look at a map here for a moment. You can see it there. Um, So Corinth, it's uh, kind of, you know, you can see the oceans nearby. It's a seaport, very wealthy city, a lot of trade there. So there's a lot of very wealthy people in Corinth. But just talk a little bit about the, the... the city of Corinth, uh, it was the capital of the Roman province of Acacia, which today is the southern half of Greece, um, second largest city in Acacia, how, uh, but, but as I mentioned, the number one financially. The temple of uh, Aphrodite, the Greek goddess of love, was in Corinth, along with 1,000 temple prostitutes. The sexual immorality of Corinth was so internationally well-known that there was actually a derogatory word used in Paul's day that meant to live like a Corinthian. If you're highly sexually promiscuous, someone might say to you, man, you live like a Corinthian. Uh, So it was known to be that sort of city. Um, And with the the goddess of love having her temple there, that probably contributed to it. Um, 
So Paul, as he's trying to give some guidelines to the what is probably by now quite a large church hiring a venue in the heart of Corinth, um, he's saying to these guys, because a lot of them are, are new converts, they're coming into the church, and their behaviour is not matching what the Scriptures teach. And he's having to write to them, hey, look, the body is not meant for sexual immorality. Um, let me read the passage as a whole here, a little bit more of it. 1 Corinthians 13 through 15, 6, 13 through 15. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. He will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? You notice Paul mentions the body there several times, and there is good reason for this. You see, one of the philosophies within the Grecian culture was the soul is important, but the body's not. Just do whatever you want with the body. You know, it's not a big deal. Fulfill all of its desires, all of its lusts. Let the body go wild. It doesn't matter. The soul's the important thing. Uh, to quote one of their, their philosophers, this is uh, Epictetus. Uh, he says um, famously, I'm a poor soul shackled to a corpse. He wrote a little bit after the time of Paul. He did write some good stuff. But what he's saying there is, you know, it's this concept. The body's not important. It's only the soul. And But Paul is saying, hey, look, the body's so important, Jesus rose physically from the dead. You know, he's emphasising, no, it's, it's the whole person. You can't separate body from soul. It's the whole person is important. Um, to read on a little bit more, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you, know, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two shall become one flesh. Now that's that phrase that we read earlier in the book of Genesis. The two shall become one flesh. The two are united together. And so here the Apostle Paul is talking about the intimacy that's referred to way back in Genesis. And the interesting thing is he uses it even in the most casual of sexual relationships. I remember when I was in Britain, there was a young lady that Pamela met with a few times who was a member of the church and she was sleeping around a lot. And I remember she said to Pamela one day, uh, look, she actually would love to be married, but that wasn't happening for her. And so she said, I just want to feel loved for a little while. And uh, she went on to say that, look, I'm not doing any harm. I'm not, I'm not sleeping with guys that are married. You know, they're just single guys. I, I re it's just casual sex. Does it really matter? And unfortunately, that is not an uncommon thought, even in some Christian circles. But obviously, the scriptures don't see it that way. Paul uses that same phrase of marriage, the two shall become one flesh, when he's talking about the most casual of relationships, a prostitute, someone you don't have to have any ongoing relationship with at all, you just pay some money, it might be just an hour, you never have to see him again. And yet he still uses the phrase, the two shall become one flesh. <clears throat> to unpack it a little bit, um, probably our most uh, prodigious intellect in Bible scholarly, scholar, scholarly works, the Bible scholar Leon Morris, who's well known all over the world, the late um, Leon Morris, he used to live here in Melbourne actually, he unpacks the passage by saying this, the two shall become one flesh. Paul uses the strong verb kalau, kalau, which means unites, a word used of close bonds of various kinds. In the literal sense, it means to glue, to glue together. Got the idea? Um, now, there are chemicals which actually help a couple glue together. Um, let me mention them to you. There is um, oxytocin and vasopressin. Um, let me read the little quote here. Uh, the love chemicals of the body, oxytocin and vasopressin, are in hormones most closely associated with romantic love. Um, now, just to, um, to do a little bit of research here about this, I've read a bunch of uh, secular research this week. Um, but the interesting thing is about these two chemicals, um, 
to say a little bit about them. Uh, these chemicals have proved to be very high in people who have lasting marriages. Isn't that interesting? Very high in people who have healthy, lasting marriages. These chemicals increase the desire to bond with someone. And these chemicals build up and up and up if you're in a healthy, monogamous relationship. Hmm. But you know what? These chemicals become less and less if you sleep around. In fact, uh, the chem- well, at its simplest, the chemicals diminish if you have multiple sexual partners. You might think it would be the opposite. This is secular research. Don't you find that interesting? It's, um, you remember the, uh, the Bible scholar? He said it's that, that meaning of the two become one flesh, unites, colloi, it's about being glued together. You may have seen this illustration before. Those two chemicals are very strong in a monogamous, healthy relationship. But when someone is sleeping around with multiple partners, united with that one, made one flesh with that one, made one flesh with this one, made one flesh with another one, just like this tape, the stickiness gets less and less and less. This is very confronting, but the chances of you having a lasting marriage is reduced if you sleep around before meeting the right person. It's extraordinary. This is secular research, isn't it? Do you want a lasting marriage? This is a big question, but it can be a big question for teenagers, young adults, or even middle-aged. Now, I know that some of you would probably be thinking, hey, but, 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 but Lee, you know, I, I've got this Christian friend, this girl or this guy, and I know they sleep around all the time. What does that mean? Does that mean that they'll never have a lasting marriage? You know, I was on the phone with someone just recently and um, uh, she's a lady who's wanting to get a life right with God. And she actually said this to me. She, <laughs> I'll quote her words. She said, I've committed every sin that you can imagine, except I haven't murdered anyone. And I said, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> At that, she, she did exactly what you did. She just laughed. Um, let, me, let me say this. No matter what you've done, God can always restore, of course. You think of uh, Jeremiah thirty seventeen, But I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. Or here's another beautiful scripture, 1 Peter 5, 10. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. But I tell you what, you ignore God's principles, including the stuff I'm talking about with sexuality, you might suffer a little while. That's what Peter's saying. You might suffer a little while, but it doesn't mean he can't restore you. But, you know, can I suggest how much better to live out God's word in the first place? to follow his teaching in the first place. You might ask the question, you know, why does the church get so caught up in this, in sexuality and stuff? Well, actually, I, I don't reckon the church preaches on this nearly enough, to be honest. Um, but there is good reason why it is a focus, and it's because there is so much teaching about it in the Scripture. Let's have a look at this here. 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 17 through 20. It says, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Again, that strong emphasis were... Paul is making there the body. It's the whole person, not just the soul. Flee sexual immorality. All other sins you commit outside the body, but when you sin sexually, you sin against yourself. Extraordinary statement. 
So according to the scriptures, there is something unique about sexual sin. And uh, it affects you far more than perhaps any of us realise. Um, great little book here. This one's called The Bare Facts. It's written by uh, Josh McDowell and Aaron, and, uh, Aaron Davies. Um, great little book. It has a lot of the research that I'm talking about today. And it might be good we have a few copies here at the church because you've got to dig to get this stuff off the, off the internet because the internet is so littered with information that's um, anything but Christian in its point of view. This is a very helpful little book. Uh, Josh McDowell's sold over 50 million books, so you know he's a big name in, as an author. This is one of his beauties, one of my favourites of his, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Big chunker, isn't it? A huge thing. Uh, his re-release of this book went number one in the USA in all the books, a top-selling book um, for that period. And uh, he said, I think it's the most expensive book that ever went number one. You can see why it's expensive. It's a big thing, isn't it? Well, he also writes this one here, The Bare Facts. Great little book, I think, for all of us to actually have a copy of and actually read up a little bit and you realise perhaps there's reasons why the Bible says what it says about sexuality because there's lots of research, and that's part of what his organisation do, to actually back up what the Bible says. Secular research, even. Um, okay, so when the Bible says, hey, if you sin sexually, you're actually sinning against your own body, I wonder what that means. Well, perhaps it affects you in a unique way. Let me give you some interesting statistics here. Sexually active teenage girls. So this is an American study, but it's, it's quite deeply documented, uh, so we're not, not up to these ones yet. But sexually active teenage girls, about... Um, is about a 300% chance of a sexually active teenage girl attempting suicide in comparison to her virgin friends. 300% more likely to attempt suicide. Um, now, I remember when I, was at, uh, when I was a young adult, actually, one of the, the visiting lecturers we had one time, she was talking about these sort of topics, and she said to us, but uh, sleeping around and stuff doesn't affect guys nearly as badly as it does girls, does it? She says to us as a class. And I think most of us thought, yeah, no, that's probably true. Yeah, and no, I'm sure it doesn't. And she said, no, you're wrong. You're completely wrong. It affects guys far more severely than it affects girls. The statistic in regards to young teenage lads who sleep around, they are 700% more likely to attempt suicide. 700%. More than twice than the girls. So what this says is, okay, well, wh wh why is that? Obviously, it does affect us more than what we realise. Anyone who sins sexually sins against their own body, their own person is how it could be translated. You know, the, the media bombards us with image, images of sex without consequences. But the reality is there are consequences. Um, I'll quote that one that's up there now. Sexually transmitted diseases. There's 25 different STDs. You know, 19 of them don't have a cure. Once you've got them, you've got them for life. Here's another one. Um, most sexually transmitted diseases initially have no symptoms. You ask the average young person, well, you know, I wouldn't be sleeping around with someone who's got an STD. Well, how would you know? The person themselves don't often know because initially there's often no symptoms. You know, some sexually transmitted viruses, including HIV, by the way, can incubate in the bodies for years without symptoms. Give me another one. In the USA, approximately 25% of sexually active teenagers contract a new STD every year. The CDC estimates that in the USA, 19 million new STD cases occur every year and half of these cases are among the 15 to 24-year-olds. By the way, it means the other half are old people. I know some people might be thinking, yeah, but, but Lee, you know, are STDs really that big a deal? Are sexually transmitted diseases that big a deal? 
Um, this is interesting. Uh, there was some um, in-depth research where a heap of 15 to 17 year olds in the United States were asked the question, um, do sexually transmitted diseases cause cancer? 40% of them knew they did, 40% of them. I reckon they're better educated than our teenagers in Australia. But the emphasis of the study was saying, look, 60% didn't know. Did you know? Let me just give you a few. I'll just pick on one of the sexually transmitted diseases. Researchers have documented a clear link between sexually, the, the sexually transmitted disease, HPV, and cancer. In fact, HPV is the cause of cervical cancer. The UCLA Medical Centre observed that up to 99% of cervical cancer patients had contracted HPV. To give you a stat of that, um, of that cancer, uh, every year approximately half a million women develop cervical cancer worldwide, or over two years, about a million women every, every uh, couple of years. About 600,000 of them over a couple of years will die from it. So it's a pretty serious form of cancer. By the way, HPV is also linked to anal and mouth cancer. An individual with HVP is 32 times more likely to develop throat cancer. So what I'm saying is they have the, certainly there are some forms of sexually transmitted disease that do cause cancer. <sighs> so when I read the scripture, 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee sexual immorality, all other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. When God inspired Paul to write those words, I'm sure God had all of this stuff in mind. We're at a, a youth event on Friday night and Pastor Michelle was preaching. Uh, there she is there. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, Pastor Michelle was talking about was the Samaritan woman. And she mentioned the Samaritan woman had had multiple partners, five husbands and then into de facto relationships. Um, she was desperately searching fulfilment, but it just she seemed to be searching in all the wrong places. And then she used an analogy about water. When you're super thirsty, you might be tempted to drink for water in the wrong places. Perhaps from a dirty puddle. But there's no water and so you're desperately trying to quench that thirst. And she brought the analogy to the young people there on the night. said, you might be drinking from dirty puddles desperately trying to fulfill or satisfy some desire, but it's not working, and you know it's not working. And she called people forward for prayer to get their lives right with God, and people came forward for prayer. <clears throat> I may have said enough, especially if you're a younger person here and even thinking of the future of having a marriage partner, I may have said enough to convince you that it's worth listening to what the Bible says and committing to one person. But you might ask the question, well, how do I make that decision? Does the Bible give me any guidelines? Uh, well, uh, let's have a look at this first. 1 Corinthians 7.39. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But, her husband, if, if, but if her husband dies, she's free to marry who she wishes. Doesn't seem to be any guidelines at all. Uh, let's look on. Let's look at the verse again and see the last bit. <laughs> a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's free to marry who she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. He must belong to the Lord. So God gives enormous freedom there doesn't talk about age or race or anything like that. He just said, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should be marrying a follower of Jesus. One guideline. And if you're thinking, has the NIV worded that right? Let's have a look at a couple of other translations. This is uh, the New Living Translation and then the Contemporary English Version. A wife is bound to a husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. 
or the CV. A wife should stay married to a husband until he dies. Then she's free to marry again, but only to a man who is a follower of the Lord. Clearly, God expects Christians to marry Christians. That's his one guideline. Um, actually, I was uh, reading, reading on in Corinthians 2, one of the things that the Apostle Paul says. He talks about the rights of, the, of an apostle at one point. And he says, you know, don't we deserve to, to earn money as we're going to be supported, as we're going around planting churches? And, and, and can't we take along a wife? But he doesn't just say a wife. He says, a believing wife, a believing wife. Um, As we move towards a conclusion, let me make this comment. God created sex. It's a beautiful gift from God designed to express love in marriage. God created sex. It's a beautiful gift from God designed to express love in marriage. That's his heart. You know, um, one of the things that uh, you, you've probably occasionally seen in statistics is that, oh, well, it's not, um, you know, Christian marriages don't do any better than um, secular marriages. But you've got to realise some of the secular things that publish that, they're basing it on simply people who tick boxes on the census. You know, over 50% of Australians say they're Christians, over 50%. But it's actually only about 10% of Australians are actually following Jesus. So heaps of them may say, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, but they don't do church. Um, They might show up at Christmas, perhaps, you know, or or Easter. But, you know, generally they don't do church. Generally they're not following Jesus. Generally they're not reading their Bible. You know, about 10% of the real deal. And if you can actually get the research where you narrow it down to genuine Christians, their marriages do a lot better than the secular world. Now, I know Christian marriages still break down, sadly. I realise, of course, they do. But the stats are a lot healthier when you get the proper information. Um, you know, there's actually another stat too, uh, which I've seen in some of the American studies. This is an interesting one. Christians who marry as virgins, the chances of their marriage being successful is way higher still. Why? Well, the Bible, of course, encourages that, doesn't it? You marry as a virgin, both of you, guys and girls. And a lot of people don't. I realise that. A lot of Christians don't. But what I'm saying, the statistical evidence is there. If Christian couples marry as virgins, the chances of a healthy marriage skyrockets. Isn't that interesting? If you do it God's way, actually, it does seem to be the right way. Um, <laughs> you know, actually, over the I know some of you are probably thinking, yeah, but no one marries as virgins anymore. That's just crazy, Lee. No one would marry as virgins, surely. Um, no, you'd be surprised. When I was at Narry Warren Baptist, we had a, a big young adult population. So um, we had three services a Sunday and our evening service of about 100 people, most of them were young adults. And so where there's lots of young adults, there's lots of marriages. <laughs> so I conducted quite a few weddings there. And uh, we did a course, a great little course, um, produced by the same church that does the Alpha course, uh, five sessions where you do some pre-marriage preparation. And in the journey of that, there's no specific questions about it, but in the journey of that, not all of them, but a lot of them, the majority of those young people admitted, both the guys and girls, they admitted they were virgins. Very committed Christians in that church, a lot of them. A lot of young people really trying to follow the scriptures with integrity. A lot of them did marry as virgins. It's a lot more common than what the secular world would ever allow us to believe. (laughs) Uh, just another little, this is more, I guess, that you'd call a case study, just based on my own experiences. Um, over the years, I've uh, been doing weddings uh, for, I guess, over 25 years now. Uh, actually um, caught up with a couple that I conducted their wedding about 25 years ago. They now have a daughter who's just got married, so that's how long ago it was. Lovely young couple. Actually, they did marry as virgins too. Um, but both, both believers in Jesus and um, still got a healthy marriage to this day. But the interesting thing is all the couples I've conducted the wedding for were both were Christians. Both were Christians. Both were believers in Jesus. Because I've, I've done quite a few too with people who are not believers who want to get married. And I think that's still a good choice that they're choosing to get married. 
But you know, with the Christians, the ones who are both Christians, I've, I've done their wedding, and that's going to span back like 25 odd years. You know, every single one of them are still together. All of them. They're all still together. As far as I can see, they have a healthy relationship. All of them. But this is a very sad statistic. Every single wedding I've conducted where they're both unbelievers or one of them doesn't believe in Jesus and the other one does, they're all divorced, every single one of them. And I know that's just a case study thing, but I still think it speaks volumes, doesn't it? <sighs> Let me finish with these uh, final scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 4, 2 through 5. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. That's what Jesus desires. But I realise today if people, you know, you know you haven't measured up to his standards, um, I'd simply say, well, start now. Start now. You know, we're told in 1 John 1, 9, beautiful verse. You should memorise this. Encouraged you to in the last series. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Jesus, if you own up to the fact you've fallen, you've failed, you've broken his directions, his commands, you own up, you confess that, he promises not only to forgive you, he promises he will purify you from all unrighteousness. And one final scripture here. Uh, let's read this one again, 1 Peter 5.10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm and steadfast. So can I just remind us, no matter what's happened, no matter what's in the past, um, yes, you, you disregard God's word, you're probably going to suffer for it, but he will still restore you. He is willing to restore you. As it said there, make you strong, Firm and steadfast. Well, as the worship team returns, let's let's close with a word of prayer. Father, here this morning, as we've unpacked actually a very challenging topic, and in my opinion, one that we don't talk enough about um, from the Bible or from the pulpit. And yet, nevertheless, Lord, one that... Um, we are bombarded with by the secular world all the time. We pray, Father, as we've looked at some of these scriptures and we've thought through the, the wider world of statistical information. I want to pray, Father, that we could be a people who embrace the word of God, who try and live out the word of God. But also I want to, I want to just pray for your healing grace. There's no one here that cannot receive your forgiveness and not be healed and not be restored, no matter what the background. And so, Father, I just want to pray for your hand of goodness and love. And I pray for all those who are married. I just want to pray for your hand of blessing and support over their marriage. May it be lasting. May it be healthy. May you bless them, Lord. In Jesus' holy name, amen.